Hey, what's up guys? 104 Maverick checking in with another video. This time we're going to take a look at how to use the Hornet radar and how to use it most effectively in BVR or beyond visual range combat. I see a lot of people getting very frustrated with the Hornet radar and claiming that the radar is no good or it's impossible for them to use effectively. Unfortunately, the cold hard truth is that most people just don't know how to use the radar properly and don't fully understand just how much work you have to put into operating the radar to maximise its potential. The reality is the Hornet radar is one of the best radars that we have in DCS, if you know how to use it properly. Its track while scan mode is hands down one of the best I've ever used, and with some practice you can become absolutely lightning quick with it, but you have to be prepared to work hard with the radar. It's not as simple as other radars in DCS, and it is pretty work intensive at times. Now, obviously, I'm not a real Hornet pilot, and sadly, we're probably never going to get a real Hornet driver doing a tutorial on the best way to use the radar. But I have been flying the aircraft for over three years now in DCS, and over that time, I've become pretty sharp with it, and I've learned a lot of lessons about how to best employ the radar, and how to take advantage of its strengths, while also overcoming some of its weaknesses. You guys will find other tutorials online that talk about and show you how the radar operates, but in this video I'm going to share some of my secrets on how I actually use the radar in combat and how you can maximise its potential to get the most from it, so hopefully you guys will start having as much fun as I do with this fantastic aircraft. Let's go ahead and get started. Alright, so the absolute first thing we want to check before we do anything with the radar is making sure that our data link is on. The reason why we want our data link to be on is because we will get an overlay on the radar screen that shows us where the data link contacts are. So we not only get this information on our SA page, but we'll actually get this overlaid on our radar page as well. So one of the things we should be doing with the radar before we go into combat is getting it set in an appropriate setup to match the weapon that we're going to employ at any given time. Now you don't have to set it up exactly the same way I do, but I'll show you here how I configure my radar for use with the AMRAM and the AIM-9 Sidewinder, and I'll explain some of the reasons why I do this as we go. Alright, first up is the AMRAM. You'll notice that when we select the AMRAM, our radar automatically goes into a 40 nautical mile search, with a 2 bar scan, in range while scan, with interleave PRF selected, and a 140 degree azimuth scan. So I'm going to change this to a 4 bar scan with 40 degree azimuth and select high PRF. I do this because I find 4 bars and 40 degrees is a great compromise for track update time versus the size of the area scanned to give me accurate and quick updates as to what my targeted contact is doing and is my default radar search setup that I use for setting up an attack with the AMRAM. I leave the elevation and azimuth centered, but you can change these values if you want to. And then when you select the AMRAM, the aircraft will default the radar setup to whatever elevation and azimuth position you choose. I now want to save this setup by clicking set on the right hand side of the radar screen. And now we can move on to the AIM-9 setup. You'll notice that with the AIM-9 selected, the radar defaults again to 40 nautical mile scan with four bars, interleave PRF again, but with 80 degree azimuth scan this time. For me, this is no good, as I want the radar to be set up to be looking in close to my aircraft whenever I select the AIM-9, as generally speaking, I'm only selecting that weapon when I'm very close to an enemy contact. So the first thing I do is select 10 nautical miles on the scan range. I then change the PRF to medium for the best chance of tracking the bandit in close, and I'll go into more detail on the PRF settings later on in the video for you guys. I then set a 20 degree azimuth scan with 6 bars. I do this because I want the fastest possible left to right sweep with the radar, but I also want to make it easier for me to find the band that I'm looking for by checking a larger altitude block with the 6 bar scan. Now this might sound a little bit counterintuitive, you guys might be sitting there thinking, hey wait a minute Maverick, if you want the fastest possible scan, shouldn't you be using 2 bar scan instead of 6 bar scan? Well, technically, the answer is yes, but in reality, using two bar scan when a bandit is in close makes getting a radar lock on them very difficult. 
because the altitude box that your radar is scanning at that range is very small. So you have to be super, super precise with where you place the scan zone in order to pick him up. Most of the time in the Hornet, we are fighting with data link overlays on our radar screen. So you already have a rough idea of where the bandit is. It's just a case of actually getting him targeted with our radar. The thing is, these radar overlays have a slight delay on them. And I may be getting information from Link that says I have a band at 4 nautical miles who is at 2,000 feet. When, in reality, he's already changed his altitude to, say, maybe 5,000 feet. So having a 6 bar scan allows me a little bit of wiggle room to be less precise with where I'm scanning with the radar, but still get a good, fast refresh rate because I'm using 20 degree azimuth to pick him up. So to save this setup to the aircraft, all we do is box set again on the right hand side and this radar setup will appear whenever we select the AIM-9. And because we have our AMRAM data already saved, we can switch back to the AMRAM and get our medium range set up with the 40 degree and 4 bar scan with high PRF and then come back to the AIM-9 setup for the in close fight and see that both are saved to the values that we input for them. The next thing we do is make sure that our IFF, our Identify Friend or Foe, is set up on Auto. So we go into our ASIL page and box Auto in the bottom left hand corner. Now there is a lot of bells and whistles that you can do with the ASIL page, none of which I use. I fly exclusively with IFF on Auto like I've just shown you guys and I never have any problems with it at all. It really does work perfectly and will automatically interrogate contacts on the radar screen for you without any fuss. So I recommend you guys just use auto and rock on. And one of the final things I like to do is set the maximum range that contacts are displayed to me on my helmet mounted display. So we go to the HMD page, then box MIDS setup and bump up the range to 100 nautical miles. And we will now get helmet symbology for contacts that are up to 100 nautical miles away when we look at them directly. Alright guys, let's talk about pulse repetition frequency, PRF. There are three modes that we can be in, high, medium and interleave. If you're having trouble locking a bandit, then it might be because you have the wrong PRF selected for where the bandit is or what he is doing. So I want to give you guys a general rule to go by. If the bandit is outside of 25 nautical miles, use high PRF. If the bandit is inside 25 nautical miles, use medium PRF. We only want to use interleave PRF if we are unsure about where the bandit is. As soon as we find out his position, however, we either switch to medium or high. I never fly the aircraft with interleave selected when I have a bandit bugged. I always have either high or medium selected based on the criteria I've just mentioned. Now you can see in this example we have the wrong PRF selected for the bandits range. They are well outside of our 25 nautical mile rule of thumb and as a result when we place our radar scan over the bandit we get no return. However as soon as we switch to high PRF you can see that the symbology changes indicating that our radar can see him and we can now get him locked and start tracking him. If we switch back to medium PRF before he is inside 25 nautical miles, you'll see that we lose lock on him and have to revert back to high PRF to be able to pick him up again. Now as the bandit crosses the 25 to 20 nautical mile mark, we can change from high PRF to medium PRF and the radar will continue to track him at that point. We could still be in high PRF here, but medium PRF is more suitable and it will track the bandit better should he start to manoeuvre defensively as we get closer to his aircraft. I just want to add a little caveat to this however. I've noticed after a recent update that in some situations medium PRF has not been picking up bandits inside of 20 nautical miles quickly enough. I suspect that there's been some undocumented radar changes from ED that has caused this to happen as previously medium PRF would always pick up a bandit inside of 20 nautical miles. So I want you to be mindful that in some cases you will need to switch from medium PRF to high PRF if the radar doesn't pick the bandit up straight away to get a lock on him. Now it's always a good idea to then revert back to medium PRF once you have the contact on radar though. As I mentioned earlier, medium PRF is much more suited to track an aircraft that are close and it will do a better job at maintaining lock should the bandit start to manoeuvre. 
yes, it is a lot of work to do and a lot of buttons to be pressing while you're potentially getting shot at, but remember what we said at the start of the video. The Hornet radar is hard work and it takes a lot of attention, but if you stay on top of it, she will look after you. You just have to know what to do in certain situations. So if you see a bandit inside 25 nautical miles, you have medium PRF selected and the radar can't pick him up. Quickly switch to high PRF to try and get a track, and once you have a track, switch back to medium PRF. Alright guys, I want to tell you right from the start that if you are in BVR combat and you're engaging bandits in range well scan, you are doing it wrong. The Hornet has one of, if not the best, TWS radar modes in DCS. And if you're not taking advantage of that, you're putting yourself at a disadvantage and making it harder for you to get kills. I always engage bandits in TWS. I exclusively use it in BVR combat and never touch the range while scan mode. The only time I ever fire at a bandit in anything other than TWS is when I'm using my ACQ modes within visual range or when I'm carrying the AIM-7 Sparrow, which I almost never do. The primary advantage of TWS is that the enemy will not get a lock or a launch warning from your aircraft once you have targeted and fired on him. The only warning the enemy will get is the active missile warning once the AMRAM goes pitbull and starts tracking the enemy on its own. If you lock a bandit in range while scan, he's going to get an alert in his cockpit that you're targeting him, giving him more time to react and start to defend your attack. He will also get a launch warning the instant you fire your missile. This makes it easier for the bandit to stay alive because he has more time to react to your shot. However, when you engage with TWS, the bandit will only get the active missile warning and won't know that you have him targeted or have fired on him until the missile goes active, giving him a lot less time to react. So golden rule guys, always, always be in TWS when fighting in beyond visual range, without exception. So with that being said, let's take a look at the TWS mode on the Hornet and how you should be using it. Okay guys, you can see here that we are in TWS with 40 nautical mile scan selected using 4 bars and 40 degree azimuth with high PRF selected. This is my preferred TWS setup for my initial acquire and tracking of bandits that are outside 20 nautical miles. We have a Russian aircraft approaching from our 11 o'clock position and we're going to cross-reference the SA page to find out where he is, how fast he's going, and what his altitude and aspect is before we start looking for him with the radar. So as you can see on the SA page now, if we move our TDC over the contact, we can get some information about him. We see from the symbology that he is hot to our aircraft and is flying at Mach 0.7 at 15,000 feet and is roughly 35 miles from our position. If we look on the radar screen, we can see that he has appeared and has been declared hostile by our Link 16 system as he's showing up red on the radar screen, just like he was on the SA page. Now it's very important that you understand that at this stage, even though he's on our radar screen, he is not on our radar. We do not have an active track on this guy because we only see the basic diamond symbol on the radar screen and we have no additional Hafu symbology yet. So this tells us that our radar does not see him. Even when we move our TDC over him, the symbology will not change because you can see that our radar sweep is not currently touching this bandit. When moving our TDC over him, we do however get information on the bandit's speed and altitude just like on the SA page. So we can then adjust our radar elevation accordingly if it's not already scanning at the target's current altitude. So in this case, we see our radar is scanning between 35,000 and 10,000 feet at this range. So if we move our scan over the contact, we should be able to pick him up. Now the radar sweep in the Hornet moves independently from our TDC position, unless we are in spot mode, which I'll cover in a little moment. So to move our sweep to the bandit's position, we need to press our throttle designator controller depress button over the area on the radar screen that we want to move the sweep to and then the radar sweep will then centre on that position where our TDC is located. You'll notice that as soon as our radar sweeps over the bandit and generates a track, 
the symbology changes on the radar screen and we get a number inside the bandit's diamond. In this case, it's a number one, indicating to us that this is the first TWS contact that we are tracking on radar. If we were painting another contact behind this bandit, his diamond would have the number two in it. This is how we actually know that we have the bandit on radar. Remember, just because he's on the radar screen doesn't mean that we have him on radar. We need to have the symbology change from the basic diamond to the symbology that you can see here. Then we know that we have the target tracked. Now if I take the radar sweep away from the contact, you'll see that the symbol reverts back to the basic diamond to indicate that we no longer have an active track on this contact. To get the radar sweep to follow our TDC, we can press and hold the throttle designator controller depress switch for over a second and when we release it, we will enter into spot mode. You can see now that the radar sweep will go wherever our TDC moves with a reduced azimuth scan. To exit out of spot mode, we simply press the throttle designate controller depress switch again on the radar screen and we'll be returned to our initial azimuth. So let's talk about locking up bandits with TWS, aka bugging contacts. We can do this two ways. First is by moving the TDC directly over the contact and then pressing the throttle designator controller depress switch over the contact to bug them. The second option, however, is much better. By simply pressing our undesignate slash nose wheel steer switch, the radar will automatically bug whatever contact is being painted by our scan. Now this is what really pays the bills in the F-18 Hornet because it saves you valuable time that you would otherwise have wasted by moving the TDC directly over the contact. This way allows you to get a track on an aircraft frighteningly quickly. You'll notice here that I do not move the TDC over the contact directly to lock them. Instead I check the bandit's altitude by moving the TDC over them and then I just move my radar sweep over to the bandit's location. Because I have my elevation set to where the contact is flying, I am able to start tracking the bandit on radar. The instant I see the symbology change on the radar screen, I can press the undesignate slash nose wheel steer switch and the radar will start tracking the contact that is being illuminated. And it will confirm this to me by putting a star inside the target's diamond to indicate that this is the current TWS target. Bugging aircraft this way is incredibly handy when the pressure is on and you need a lock fast as you don't need to waste precious milliseconds by being precise with the TDC position. So we are in a position now where we're tracking the bandit and we're getting ready to fire. As the bandit is crossing our 25 to 20 nautical mile mark that we discussed earlier in the video, I'm going to make the change to medium PRF to have the best chance at maintaining a radar lock on him. Now before we fire, I want to show you guys a neat little trick that the Hornet radar has and that is switching our fire control radar to auto so that it moves our radar sweep as we maneuver the aircraft to maintain a lock on the bandit. As I mentioned previously, the radar sweep moves independently of the TDC position unless we are in spot mode. So if we maneuver our aircraft without having the FCR in auto, we have to manually move our radar sweep using the TDC to maintain lock. However, by simply pressing the right center button on the MPCD so that auto is boxed, we can now start maneuvering our aircraft and the radar will automatically track the bandit in azimuth and elevation. Now ideally, you should be making this switch selection every time you bug a contact that you want to shoot at. However, if you forget to do this and you leave it in manual, if we don't adjust the radar sweep position ourselves, the radar will not follow the contact and the track will be lost. So you can see that if we select manual here and start to maneuver, the contact moves outside of our sweep and we lose track. Now we move the radar sweep back over the target and bug them by pressing our undesignate nose wheel steer switch and then instantly select auto on the FCR. We can then start to maneuver as much as we want and the radar will track them. This is good Hornet driver behavior guys. And if you can make yourself do this every time you want to engage someone, it will become second nature and you won't have to consciously think about it. But here is another golden rule for you guys. Any time you lose lock on a bandit when you're tracking him using this auto mode because they either broke line of sight behind some terrain or you maneuvered out of gimbal limits and they are no longer on the radar screen or you just simply lose lock on them, 
you must reselect manual. This is a massively important step, as if you forget to do so, you will have problems manually adjusting your radar elevation to reacquire the same bandit or a new bandit. So golden rule number two guys, always, always instantly reselect manual if you lose lock on the target for any reason, then once you reacquire them, reselect auto again. Now doing this obviously increases your workload and it can be easy to forget while under serious pressure as you're getting shot at. But I want to reiterate, the Hornet radar takes a lot of work to get the best results from it. It's not for lazy pilots or the faint of heart. You need to be in there working with it constantly. But the more practice time you put in with it, the easier it becomes. And if you can train yourself to follow these steps, you'll start to notice results very quickly. All right guys, here's a quick example of how you can use TWS effectively with some advanced tactics. All right, you can see here that we have a bandit in the notch who is pressing in on us at around 15 miles. Our plan here is to allow him to come closer so we can fire on him with a higher probability of kill. We have him highlighted on the SA page so we get continuous updates on his speed and altitude so that we don't need to TDC over him for this info. If you don't know how to do this, make sure you check out my previous video titled How to Lock Contacts on the SA page. Because we know his bearing range and altitude, we're going to get a radar set up so that it's looking in the right place for him before we turn in to engage. So if we do all this correctly, all we need to do is get the radar to paint him, then bug him by pressing the undesignate nose wheel steer switch, instantly followed by pressing auto on the fire control radar, and then fire him. Alright, here we go. So we're setting the radar up now to look at where he's going to be once we turn in. Around about 15,000 feet and the 10 nautical mile mark. We make sure we're in medium PRF because he's inside that 20 nautical mile range that we talked about earlier on. And when he reaches 11 nautical miles, we're going to turn in and find him. Okay, here goes. Alright, there we go. The radar instantly finds him at 11,000 feet, 10 nautical miles. We bug him by pressing the undesignate nose wheel steer switch and instantly select auto on the fire control radar. Now the radar follows the contact as we manoeuvre to the left and we start to defend the shot. Boom. We now reset our fire control radar to manual and get ready for the next target. Always try to keep your radar off a target until you're almost ready to fire. Just because he is on our radar screen doesn't mean we have to paint him with our radar. The longer we point our radar at him before we fire, the more warning we give the bandit that we are looking at him. If you lose lock while tracking a bandit with auto selected, remember you don't need to TDC over him to reacquire as long as the radar is still painting him. Simply press the undesignate nose wheel steering button again to lock him up in TWS and reset your fire control radar to manual and then back to auto again to start tracking the bandit. Try to avoid pointing your nose at a bandit until you are ready to fire. Flying straight towards the aircraft you are targeting is the biggest giveaway that you intend to shoot at it. Instead, leave him at the side of your radar until you are close enough to fire, then turn your nose onto him and let it rip. Use the SA page as much as possible to preset your radar for where the bandit is going to be before you turn in. Your goal should always be to get an instantaneous lock as soon as the bandit is within gimbal limits. We want to do our best to avoid having to change our elevation and scan position after we turn in and instead have the radar preset so it sees him straight away. If you're trying to find a bandit that is inside of 10 nautical miles, it's often a good idea to switch to a 6 bar scan. This will automatically put you in a 20 degree azimuth sweep and will provide you with the quickest left to right scan whilst also searching the most amount of altitude for the bandit. This makes it easier for you to pick up a bandit who may be rapidly changing altitude from where the data link says he is.
Thank you so much for watching guys. I hope this video helps you to get to grips with the Hornet Radar and you start reaping the benefits in the virtual skies. If you enjoyed the video, please do me a massive favour and hit that like button and make sure you subscribe to stay up to date with future tutorials and videos. Top Gun and Volleyball folks, I'm not Scott Mann. Fly safe.